We're going to start a new series in the book of Titus um, tonight, uh, through the book of Titus. And um, I'm going to call the, the, the title, uh, really it comes from the theme verse, which is in Titus uh, 1 and, um, and um, verse number 5. He says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. And really the whole book of Titus is about setting some things in order. And, um, and so that's, uh, that's really what the, the, the series and the theme is going to be about. And looking at it from that perspective, what in this are we uh, setting in order? And, and uh, what was God doing with the churches there in Crete as he was talking to, Timi- uh, to Titus? And, um, and what uh, all these years later does he really have for our church? And, and you might be surprised as, I, as I've been studying and unpacking this a little bit, looking into uh, the culture and everything there. Uh, the parallels of the society and the culture in Crete, um, not far off from what we're dealing with today. Um, and uh, so we'll get into that a little bit uh, this evening. But uh, our text, uh, I, I, when I started outlining this and preparing, I ha- was planning on doing the first four verses. We're going to get through verse one tonight, I think. And so uh, we'll see how we do. But, um, but I, I want to really unpack this and dive into it. I, I love verse by verse studies as we go through we don't leave anything out we have to deal with sometimes the tough passages but we're going to wrestle with them and we're going to get through them and uh and many times when we we take our time uh i tell you what we come back later and and you might reference a verse from that book or you might reference something that was going on and uh and that verse all of a sudden has so much more meaning so much more depth because you understand the background you understand the context what's going on there and uh, so much danger dangerous theology in Christianity today is really because we've removed things from their context and we don't know context we don't know the context of the Bible we don't know the context of that book of that verse and and uh, so this is so helpful as we go through this I pray it'll be a blessing to us but Titus 1 and verse number one the Bible says this Paul a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. And let's pray. Father, I ask that you would help us tonight as we uh, begin this new book study. Lord, would you guide and direct, understanding that this book is uh, meant to be in our Bibles, and this was inspired, and uh, you've preserved it through all these years for us to, to glean from today and to even apply to our own local church. And Lord, I pray that you would help us, give us understanding uh, as we look through this. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we look at uh, the book of Titus, uh, really it's a, it's a good book. It's what we call a pastoral epistle. All right? There's three letters in the New Testament that were directly written to, to pastors or elders or bishops. Uh, those three words are really interchangeable in the New Testament. And, um, and, and, and with that, he gives some instruction for churches and gives some instruction for leadership. And uh, so, so Titus is no different than First Second Timothy in the regard of, of, you know, this is a young pastor who's got a big job. Now, what's different about Titus as opposed to Timothy is Timothy was a pastor of one church, uh, the church at Ephesus, when he wrote uh, uh, First Second Timothy to him. Titus had a little bit different mission. As an elder, he was set to an island to oversee a whole bunch of churches, upwards of 100 churches on the island of Crete. And, uh, and he put him there for that purpose. So he is a, he is a, uh, a training pastor. Um, he is fulfilling 2 Timothy 2.2 2, when Paul said to Timothy, uh, Hey, Timothy, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Here's Titus, been trained at the hand of Paul, and he's been put on this island. He said, I want you to go church to church, and I want you to fix some of these problems. Can you imagine that? You know, he's he's kind of taken on the role of the Old Testament prophet. When the Old Testament prophet would come to town, uh, many times they'd greet him and say, uh, you know, uh, are you here for a good reason or a bad reason? You know, what, 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 what kind of message do you have? And, you know, is this a judgment visit or is this a blessing visit? And, um, and so here's Titus. He's coming to town, and in many cases he's coming with some, some, some tough talks. Uh, this man is, you know, uh, I was thinking a little bit about Titus, why Paul chose Titus for a couple of the things that he had chosen for. We don't know a whole lot, but, uh, but we do know some things from scriptures. In 2 Corinthians, Paul sends Titus to the Corinthians, and he warns them ahead of time that Titus is coming to collect on uh, the promise that you guys made when it came to giving for the saints in Jerusalem. So you better be ready. 
You don't want to be embarrassed. You don't want to be ashamed when he shows up and you're not ready. I mean, so Paul's the bad news guy, or uh, Tim, uh, Titus. He's coming, and he's, uh, he's like, I'm here to collect. I mean, he's, he's uh, the collection man uh, in that regard. But uh, here he's going to go and set things in order uh, in these churches. And as we unpack this and move on through the book, we're going to see some of those things that were out of order. But let's just say there were some, uh, some people that had t- taken the leadership of these churches that were just making a mess of things and really starting to reflect the society around them more than the Christ within them. So Paul wrote the book of Titus uh, for, his, uh, uh, for his companion, his, uh, his mentee, as he was the mentor, and, um, and, and, um, and he was tasked with going to Crete uh, to really uh, a place that was known for their sin, known for their corruption, and Titus was to restore order to these house churches, these small churches that were in every city, uh, in, in Crete that had been and, and replaced the corrupt teachers with some godly teachers to ordain elders in every church, in every city. And so let's talk about this a little bit on who this is for, just by way of introduction, who's the recipient of this book, and then we'll spend most of the time on who the author of this, uh, this letter is. But the recipient, Paul wrote this book to Titus, and uh, Titus had led, uh, Ty, uh, excuse me, Paul had led Titus to Christ. I talk so much about Timothy, so I'm probably going to get Timothy's name mixed up in here. I'm going to get Paul's name mixed up, and so bear with me. We know we're talking about Titus, right? And so if I miss it, you know, you know who we're talking about. But, uh, but Paul led him to Christ. Um, Titus was from Antioch, and uh, Titus was completely Greek. He, he, was, he was of that culture, and he was uh, of that background and that upbringing, and, and, uh, and his, he was of Gentile origin, unlike Timothy, who was half Greek, half Jew. Uh, Tim, uh, Titus was fully Greek. And... Um, Titus, uh, Titus was a strong Roman name. It was a name that carried some weight, and it was a pretty common name in the Greek culture in the, 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 the first century Rome. And um, in fact, um, uh, 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 General Vespasian, uh, he call, it was a conquering Roman general, and the name of his son was Titus. His son would uh, follow in his dad's footsteps uh, as a mighty general, and he was the infamous one known for burning Jerusalem to the ground in 70 AD. That's that Titus. And so Titus was, uh, was kind of a common name, and, uh, but this was a different Titus. This was a godly Titus, and, um, and uh, he was a young man that traveled with Paul. He was there for many of, uh, of Paul's difficulties, his struggles. He witnessed Paul being persecuted. Uh, he witnessed a lot of things that Paul went through, and, um, and uh, Paul was, uh, he was with Paul through, through those things. T- Titus is mentioned nine times just in the Second Corinthians letter alone. And so this church, he was with Paul uh, in one of his visits, at least one of his visits to the Corinthian church. And so they're familiar with him. Uh, he was one of the companions of Paul. Uh, Titus was with Paul at Jerusalem Council when the uh, difficult issues were dealt with there. And this might have been part of, think about this, this was part of uh, Titus's training, seeing how Paul, this man of God, this apostle, this uh, preacher, uh, this servant of Christ, is addressing the church at um, at uh, Jerusalem and dealing with some tough issues on how that, that God was doing some changes here and that the gospel is going to the Gentiles and, and Paul was the apostle chosen for that duty. And, uh, and there was some confusion and, you know, what about circumcision? And they were kind of discussing a lot of those issues. And so Titus gets to watch Paul have some of these very difficult discussions and, uh, and even some contentious discussions, right? And we know Paul had some, some conversations that had some, some tension in them, right? Uh, you, we know that, uh, that him and Silas had some tension over uh, John Mark, right? We know that Paul withstood Peter to his face because he should be blamed because, uh, uh, because he, he, he separated himself from the Gentiles when he saw the Jews from Jerusalem showing up. And, uh, and so he watched Paul go through some very difficult things, but this council of Jerusalem must have been a really tough thing. Here are the, here are the pillars of the church in the early days. You have all the other apostles, and you have Paul over here. And, uh, and he shows up, and, uh, and he watches how he reasons with them, and he watches how he deals with them. And I think much of that is, was going to play into this thing as how he's going to go into these churches, and what's he going to do? He's going to reason with them. He's going to discuss some things in these churches and say, guys, here's the, what the scriptures teach, and here are some things that are out of order. You're missing some things here. And so, so this, is, uh, this was some of his training with, uh, with the Apostle Paul. Um, Paul was on a ship sailing uh, during his first imprisonment, 
and uh, they stopped at the island called Crete. Acts, uh, Acts 27 speaks of this. Uh, this may have been Paul's first exposure to, uh, to Crete and the Cretans. After his imprisonment, it must have so impressed upon Paul, he must have been so burdened for this island, that he took Titus to go to Crete, and, uh, and there the two men they ministered for quite some time. And no doubt, as Paul would do, he'd preach the gospel. He'd share his testimony, no doubt. And, uh, and as they were there in Crete, I'm sure some people got saved. I'm sure some churches were established. Um, and so as we consider, as, as, as they're there in Crete, first century Crete, the Cretan culture was notorious uh, for being liars. That's what they were known for. They were just, they were just liars. Uh, in fact, one of the Greek words used for being a liar was uh, uh, kretizo, which means to be a Cretan. That's one of the words for being a liar. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if, uh, if the euphemism for being a liar was a North Korean or an Alaskan? Oh, Alaskans, they always lie. I mean, how do you get that reputation? <laughs> That's how they were. In fact, it shouldn't surprise us because Crete was the birthplace or the origin, place of origin, if you would, of the chief god Zeus. That's going to come into play if we look at some of the things that some of these churches may have bought into because they were starting to blend the God of the Bible and, and the Greek God, Zeus, as being like the head God in their mythology. But, but think about some things with Zeus. How have you studied uh, Greek mythology a little bit when you were a kid? Okay. Does it ever seem like, like a soap opera? <laughs> like, it's the strangest stuff. It's like, these are deities? These are you know, people that should be worshipped? Um, but think about Zeus. Zeus was known for being a liar, a trickster, a uh, and, uh, and so, um, which is why he's going to, um, don't want to give away next week's message, but, but why he starts off in verse 2, that uh, which God that cannot lie. He references that. Why? Because Zeus is a God that lies. And the true God is not like that. A true God is not a, uh, a God that would lie. And, uh, but the, the Cretans, they were known for being liars. Uh, many of the men of the island, on the island had served as mercenary soldiers to the highest bidder. And uh, these cities were known for being unsafe, plagued with violence and sexual corruption. However, the island of Crete had strategic harbors, and uh, they served uh, cities all over the Mediterranean Sea. And that might have been Paul's perspective as he was considering this island and why they had to establish a network of churches to make an impact as many would come to and fro through that port and through that area. Kind of reminds me there's a story. The, the illustration just came to my mind, so forgive me for not having the name of the person, but there was a man from Sydney, Australia, and, uh, and he every single day would give out gospel tracts, every single day. And, um, and people, people would come through, military would come through Sydney, Australia on different, uh, different uh, assignments. Uh, people would come through on cruises. All kinds of things would come through Sydney, Australia, and this man would, every day would just hand out gospel tracts and out gospel tracts every single day till he was an old man. Well, um, well, this, uh, uh, the story was told of, uh, I believe there was a missions conference or a revival meeting or something that was going on in Germany, and, uh, and people were giving their testimony, and they were talking about how they, they got saved because they read a tract that was given to them from this man in Sydney, Australia. And there's another person there who said, I got saved from a man, getting a track from a man in Sydney, Australia. And, and this, you know, different people are popping up all over the place. And, and forgive me, I don't have all the details of the story, but it's just fascinating how all these people started connecting as they were sharing testimonies over years of time of finding out, oh, this person got saved because of this man in Sydney, Australia. So one man who got saved uh, uh, from this or had heard this story um, decided, I'm going to go to Sydney, Australia and see if I can find this man. So he's walking around, and he's asking questions. Does anybody know where this man is? And they say, oh, we haven't seen him in a while. And, uh, and they finally heard from one person, oh, that man that would always hand out these pamphlets. Oh, he lives at such and such place. So he shows up. There's this little, uh, this little withered old man there and, uh, who his health failed him. He wasn't able to give out tracts anymore. But, uh, you know, he's kind of at the end of his life. And he tells them the story and tells them all these different people he'd come across who had gotten tracts from a man in Sydney, Australia. And, uh, and tears in this man's eyes. He said, I never knew if it ever made a difference. If I remember the story right, he said he had never known one convert from handing out gospel tracts. And he stayed faithful day after day after day. But I think about that as a, as a port city, if you would, as there's a lot of coming and going and there's commerce and there's, uh, there's uh, vacations and travel and, and all that stuff. Uh, what a strategic place. By the way, can I say this? 
you may come across some, somebody who is coming and going, traveling, or you may be traveling. Um, you never know what impact you're going to make. Yeah, Carrie Gospel Tracks when you're on vacation. I remember my wife and I, we were on vacation one time, and there was a church putting on a, they had a soul winning booth at a fair. And my wife and I, we volunteered for a couple hours, and uh, we, saw, we saw 10 people saved in the two and a half hours that we were at this fair. It was just awesome. And, and it was with, uh, we had those little, uh, we had props, you know, the three things that God cannot do. And, and people, people always come up all bold, God, God can do anything, right? And so, well, look inside, tell, tell, see, if, uh, see if you agree what God cannot do. And one of them is the verse here, God cannot lie. Okay, I get that, God cannot lie. You know, God cannot change. Okay, I get that. God cannot change. And the third one, God cannot let you into heaven unless you are born again. Perfect segue into the gospel. And, uh, and so we saw many people saved, and I was rejoicing with the ones we saw saved and got their contact information, their connection with the church. And, uh, and I remember this wet blanket friend of mine, <laughs> and uh, I posted on Facebook just rejoicing. Uh, we saw, you know, 10 precious souls saved, and, and, uh, and he said, well, who's going to disciple them? First of all, yes, we got the contact information, and we'll be following up, okay? Second of all, if I don't have the opportunity to disciple them, should I just keep my mouth shut and let them go to hell? Who's going to disciple them? If they got saved, they get the Holy Spirit, by the way. If they got saved, you know, they got the Holy Spirit, they, get, they got a Bible. They, they, you know, yeah. I'm just saying, yeah, we should help them as much as possible. And as, as we see people saved and lead them to Christ, we should uh, disciple them along and get them plugged in and all that stuff. But, but let me just say, you know, this is, when, when, I, when I think about a place like this, you know, uh, I, I used to pastor. My first pastorate was in a resort community. And, by the way, life get dis- gets discouraging after a while uh, being a church planter. You see a, a whole family show up, and, boy, they got it together, and they got their children. And they're all even dressing up for church. You're like, oh. A great family on vacation in my town. <laughs> like, well, I hope you were blessed with your time with us, you know, and, and uh, um, you know, but, uh, but, but what an opportunity to, to, to share the gospel with people as they come through. And I think Crete was one of those potentials. And um, so we don't know all the details, but somehow these churches came under the influence of corrupt leadership. We'll see that later on in the book. Uh, Titus was sent to uh, set those things straight. The general thinking of, um, uh, uh, of the already established churches was that the, the, their people, or, or where these churches came from, these established churches, was it was likely that, the, that some of these folks came back to start churches that got saved at Pentecost. And uh, I believe that's how the churches in Rome were started. They were believers from Pentecost that got saved, went back home, and started witnessing. Uh, Roman, Romans is interesting because... There was no apostle that had visited Rome. And Paul so desired to be there, and he even made a point. I was not going to build on someone else's foundation. No one had been there. So where did these Christians come from? I think they came from uh, the day of Pentecost. In Acts 1, it talks, or Acts 2, it talks about there were strangers from Rome uh, that were there in Jerusalem. But anyways, uh, how, however it happened, there was a number of churches that had corrupt leaders uh, established in these, um, in these places. By the way, think about this. Pentecost happened. What was the date of Pentecost, anybody? May 17th. No, no. it was, um, it was, uh, it was you know, 33 A.D. or so, right? Um, at what point now are we at in Paul's life where he's sending Titus to go to Crete? We're talking a lot of years later, right? Paul went 14 years before he even started ministering. And then he has Titus on his at least second missionary journey. And then he leaves him there in Crete. Okay, So we're talking a lot of years removed. Without having an apostle visit, without having some kind of authority, what scriptures did these churches have? The, the Old Testament. Right? They didn't have a ton of leadership. And, uh, and what leadership they had were becoming very corrupt, and, and we'll see that. There, there was a lying spirit there. There was uh, probably Judaizers that were there as well, as he's going to talk about them of the circumcision. Um, 
So what's the purpose of this letter? The letter uh, um, to Titus, uh, just like to Timothy, Titus is dealing with issues of church life, of worship in the church, the doctrine of the church, and behavior in the church. The theme verse of this, uh, of this book, as I read earlier, is uh, verse 5, to set in order those things. Uh, to go to every church, uh, uh, set in order uh, the things. Um, well, let me go ahead and read it. Uh, for this cause left of the increase, the should have set in order the things that are wanting or the things that are lacking and then ordain elders or, or set the leadership in place. And so many of these churches develop strong leaders that uh, even uh, uh, or these churches here, uh, strong leaders, uh, church history records, uh, were in these churches and they, they developed some strong churches that uh, in the days to come when great persecution would rise up, many of these churches did not bow the knee. And many of them actually became martyrs. And now think about this thought, okay? This, this church, that, uh, these churches that Titus goes and tries to strengthen some things and tries to, uh, to, to impart some truth to them, got such conviction and such strength that even after Titus is dead and gone and passes from the scene, these churches, a few generations later, when, 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 when di- uh, cor- uh, uh, difficulties come, persecution arises, did not bow the knee. I wonder... After you and I pass on, as, as Cornerstone Baptist Church has been established and, uh, and it's growing, uh, I wonder when you and I pass on, what the next generation and the generation after that, if the Lord tarries, it, it, what are they going to stand on? What conviction? What are we instilling? And, and let me just say this. I know there's a lot that we're working on. We're trying to you know, see people saved and we're trying to get involved in missions and there's all these things. And, and yes, this generation needs saving. But we want to make sure that we are doing it in such a way that the next generation catches on and grabs a hold of the things that we're laying down, okay? Um, lest we be like ancient Israel where there rose up a generation that knew not the Lord, knew the things which he had done. That is such a powerful, powerful verse all the way back to, I believe it's in Judges. And there rose a generation which knew not the Lord. And, and I want to make sure, and, and really the book of Titus, I believe, is kind of going to lay out, if you would, some of the things that we can emphasize to, to keep that from happening. Um, <clears throat> but I believe that, uh, uh, I, I believe them carrying on and standing on truth and standing for the Lord Jesus Christ um, has much to do with the order that was placed in these churches that was that was set there. Paul is going to deal with the lifestyle of these believers. In fact, in, in Titus 2 and verse number 14, it says this about Christ, who gave himself for us, get this now, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous unto good, uh, of good works. Now, when, when we get saved, we are redeemed, and we are redeemed, yes, from all sin. And from all iniquity, but notice this: this is in this life. He's gonna he's gonna redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself. That's a, that's us in our fellowship of Him. That's in His sanctifying work in our lives as uh, He purifies unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous unto good works. So the idea is this: that on the one hand we are being purged and set apart, fit for the Master's use. On the other hand, there is a zeal, a passion, a, a, a ambition, if you would. To serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I want to say this. Both of those things, both sides of that coin, really are under attack in our day and age that we're living in. Um, well, I'll come back to that. But like us, those in the first century, they're always being pulled away from godliness. They had to be challenged to be a peculiar people. They had to be challenged to follow the Lord and keep their eyes on him and remember the one who had saved them and called them from darkness into his marvelous light. See, Christians ought to have a lifestyle different than the world. By the way, isn't it interesting how the world knows that? You know, lost people know that. Uh, Pastor McGovern, when he was here, he talked about, uh, uh, you know, back in the day, you might hear a phrase, well, that's not a very Christian thing to do or a Christian thing to say. You don't really hear that as much today. Uh, because most people don't know the Christian thing to do or say. But there was a cultural aspect of Christianity that, that, that really was a part of the framework of American culture, and that is to act like a Christian. Get your yay, be yay, and your nay, nay. Do a deal on a handshake. And, and one of the worst insults that you could get 
uh, in the early days of America is to be called a liar or to have your integrity brought into question. Today, it's no big deal. You can think what you want to think. But these are some of the things that Paul was, uh, was reminding Titus of, of the, of the pull and the allure to be like the world and to blend in. And, you know, we don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to be too different from the culture around us. After all, they're going to think we're weirdos. They're going to think we're peculiar. See, spiritual leadership was in this day and is still today uh, is a great need in the New Testament church. Why? Titus 1.10 says this, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. That's what they're dealing with there. But why do we need strong, godly leaders? Because there are many, there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. And let me just say, many of them are smooth talkers. Many of them are very charismatic in their, in their, uh, in, in their presentation, in their presence, and, and, uh, and, and are very good at articulating some things. And they deceive the hearts of many, and they'll, they'll pull people away from the truth. And so there must, there's a great need to take the scriptures and to, and to set that good foundation and to, to set the things in order that are starting to waver, that are starting to lack a little bit. So these false teachers, they were drawing people away, and Titus was there to confront them. Again, how would you like that, that commission from Paul? All right, Titus, I'm going to lead you here. Now, he's seen Paul address some things. He saw Paul with tears right First Corinthians. He said, guys, it grieves me to write this letter to you. And then Second Corinthians, I, I didn't want to come to you again with heaviness. So there's a couple of little things i got to still remind you of. And, and he saw the way he confronted them. He saw him, him maybe withstand Peter, and he saw those difficulties and, and, and how it wore on him because, because here's, here's the Apostle Paul, and yes, he loved truth, and yes, he wanted to stand on truth, but you know these people you've poured yourself into. Let me just say this. If you and I ever have to sit down in a meeting and, and, and deal with some hard things, I want you to know it is incredibly grievous to have to sit down and say, you're wrong, and you're messing up, and you're not pleasing the Lord. And you're going against scripture. And I've had to have those conversations. And we've had to exercise church discipline in the past on, on, on people that have just chosen their way and even spiritualized it. Tried to say, oh, God's okay with this. And, and, and show them, look, you are in blatant sin. It is so difficult to deal with those things. And then to take it so far as you bring it before the church. And the church weeps cries out out of love and a broken heart that this brother or sister would be right. So Paul tells Titus, Paul tells Titus, hey, we're going to go to this island where there's a good bunch of good brothers and sisters. There's a bunch of churches that have fallen into some bad leadership. I want you to go in there <laughs> and straighten them out. Can you imagine that call? Luckily, there's actually not a full-time ministry position that fulfills that need. I'm sure there are those that would relish it. I'm sure there are those that would say, hey, that's my call, right? Titus must have been a prophet. I don't know how else he could have done it as far as the spiritual gift of prophecy. So Paul writes this letter, and he tells him, he encourages him, but think about this. He writes this letter. Think about having the backing of the Apostle Paul and have that letter. And I've been sent, I've been commissioned by Paul himself to go and do this. That's awesome. So Paul starts off this letter in case anyone else is going to read it. By the way, thank the Lord we get to read it today. And he starts this off in verse number one. Paul, a servant of God and the Apostle of Jesus Christ. So let's look at this, uh, the identity of this author. He starts off, Paul a servant of God. Now, if you are commissioning somebody, many times you might want to have that the stamp of approval or, or some kind of authority attached to that thing, right? Uh, um, we call uh, uh, the old name for the King James Bible. Anybody know what it used to be called? The authorized version. 
some try to keep it that way. It's that it's not the modern learning. It was the re they had it was an attachment to it. Some have taken it so far. Oh, this is authorized by God. Listen, it is authorized by God. Okay, but it meant it was authorized by the king of England. His stamp of approval was on that thing, right? Now that's a pretty good commission. I I am I am doing this task on behalf of the king. That's pretty cool. But what's interesting is Paul does not jump to that. What, when Paul does not talk about his credentials, he starts off with this thing, his relationship before God as being sent from God. He says, Paul, a servant of God. The word for servant there is, uh, is doulos, which is a different word than, than is many times used for, for servant or minister where we get the word deacon. This word is, re, is re, uh, referring to someone who is a slave owned by somebody else, a bond servant. And um, it, it carries the idea of a word of ownership or purchased possession. Now, this is very interesting because here's the Apostle Paul who's been purchased by the blood of Christ, who is saved by grace, and he's going around uh, with God's authority, establishing churches and doing all the things he's done, writing inspired scripture, yet he identifies himself as a bond servant. What's interesting about that is it is for the Jews especially they they knew the Old Testament very well and especially the uh, the the first five books the Pentateuch the foundation of them if you would um, and and what's interesting is if you go back to Exodus twenty one you don't have to turn there right now just for sake of time but in Exodus twenty one uh, uh, God was establishing with Israel if you have a slave or if you have a servant he can work for you for six years and then he's earned his freedom what's interesting is in Exodus twenty one here's what it says. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If the master hath given him a wife, and she hath borne him sons and daughters, the wife and, uh, or, and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, get this now, if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges, and uh, he shall bring him to the door or unto the post, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Get this now. He takes, it, he takes him, and he, and he makes it a declaration. I know I can go free now, but I love my master. I love how he's taking care of me. I love how he's provided for me. And so they take him now, and they, they take him before the, the leadership, if you would, and what do they do? They pierce his ear. And he, and he has a distinguishable mark in his ear that I am now a bond servant. And the commitment is not another six years like you're in the military. The commitment is life. I'm a bond servant. And that's the word over and over again Paul uses when he talks about his introduction, when he gives his salutation. Uh, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, or in this case, a servant of God. A bond servant. I, I am a slave. A slave does not do his own will, but does the will of the master. A slave does not have his own ambitions, dreams, desires, but, but, but that of him who owns him. That's the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul was a true servant. He had many credentials he could have listed, uh, yet he chose the title, which would be scoffed at, laughed at. Think about the culture in the, in the first century Rome. What was Rome all about? Strength and might. I mean, this is this is home to the Olympics. When we were studying First Corinthians, we 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 learned about the the Isthmus Games, and which were many times in many ways a bigger deal than the Olympics themselves. And the winners of those competitions would be would be uh, 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 turned into deities, if you would. They'd be worshipped and, and sacrificed unto, and 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 they're all about the perfect man, uh, and and uh, um, they, they they were about strength and might, and then the Greeks were all about knowledge and wisdom and understanding and all these big wow things. So when Paul goes to Corinth, what does he say? He talks about the power that is in the cross. What? Cross is weak. Cross is defeat. Cross is, is, is and he says, no, no, we're going to flip things around because God's going to use the foolish things and the weak things to confound the wise. So Paul comes and he says, he says um, this is who I am as I'm writing this letter, servant. You know, it's interesting. Paul, as he's laying out also an example for Titus, I think he knew that 
he struggled with, Heidi struggled with, Timothy struggled with, the same things you and I struggle with today. And that is pride. And he identifies himself over and over again as this servant, as nobody and nothing. And, and, and you know, who, you know who is who is Paul and who is who is uh, Apollos and 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 you know, but servants, servants of Jesus Christ, ministry. You know, that's a big problem with modern day ministry. We 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 love to so like you know, we we made all these heroes out of these preachers and we put them up on pedestals and. And, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a weird thing. It really, it's a weird thing. Now, by the way, I'd rather you have a preacher that's your kid's hero than a, than a sports star or something along those lines. But, but, but let me just say, um, it's, and, and some of you know what I'm talking about. If you've been around some certain conferences or certain circles, it's like, it's like, you know, he puts his pants on one leg at a time like you, right? You know, and, 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 and we so, we, we, then we look at that. We look at maybe the glamour of ministry, what it could look like. We look at different things, and, and we realize, well, where's, where's the, the servanthood? Where, where are those things? You see, biblical leadership is servant leadership. No matter how established you may, may get in your career, or how wisely you've invested your money, or whatever it might be where you find value, and you lose your servanthood, let me just say, your life becomes worthless. There's not much worth left to it. There's, there, there's not much less of a point as far as God's concerned. Aristotle defines a slave as this, uh, uh, living property, living property. That's not a bad definition of, of a slave. It's kind of like what Romans 12 says, living sacrifice, living property. He said that he is a servant of God, the Apostle Paul, but he, a servant of uh, not only to God, but to his purpose. Romans 6.22, he says, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. We are now free from sin. You become a servant of God. 1 Corinthians 6.20, Ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. See, if you're saved... You're not here for yourself. Your purpose is not to bring glory to yourself, but your purpose is to bring glory to God. To him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, you have become a servant. You've been bought with a price. I like how Romans lays it out there in Romans 6, if we had time to unpack it. But the, the conclusion really of Romans 6 is this. You are going to be a servant to somebody. You might as well pick a good master. been bought with a price. So as the author starts out his letter, he says, I want to give you my identity as a servant of God. Then you see Titus rolling into town and saying, guys, I'm here to fix some things. I'm going to be watching for a little while, and then I'm going to give you my conclusions. And they'll look at him, by what authority? The servant sent me. The servant sent me. I like how John the Baptist put it. He must increase, but I must decrease. I heard one preacher say it this way, and I thought it was very good. The bigger, the bigger you get, the smaller God gets. The smaller you get, the bigger God gets. And the context is in your life. You know what Paul said about the thorn? He said, when I'm weak, then am I strong. Folks, we think we got it together. We think we, we've got some things figured out, and you know whether it be in the Christian life or just life in general. And 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 we you know we think you know uh, I I've arrived, and and God's like you don't even know it yet. What does the Bible say about pride and a haughty spirit and all those things? Isn't it amazing how we use the word pride? Uh, you know, there's not one positive usage of the word pride in the Bible. It's amazing how we throw that thing around. You know, these six things that the Lord hates, these seven are an abomination. First on the list, a proud look. If God only listed seven things that he absolutely hates, I think I want to stay far away from the list of seven. How about this one? God resisteth the what? 
How many of you want God resisting you? You see? Now, now I may not be able to do much. You know, I, I, God's still working on this part of me. But I think I can, ma- I can help it a little bit if I just get rid of the word. I'm tired of this, tired of that. Be proud of yourself. Be proud of your accomplishments. Be proud of your children. Be proud. By the way, I love, I love the shock I get from people when they say, you've never said to your children you're proud of them? I try to use the word God uses. When God could have said he was proud of his son, what does he say? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I tell my children all the time how pleased with them I am. Pride has a, creates a deal like, I had something to do with that. But he starts off with this, this idea of being a servant. What would happen in our marriages if instead of saying, well, I'm the man of the house, we go into that thing and say, I'm going to serve and be a servant. What would happen if our jobs tomorrow, if we just go, you know what, I'm going to be a servant of Jesus Christ today. I'm going to do this job as unto the Lord. What would happen? How would that start changing things? Maybe our influence. Maybe, and by the way, you know, don't say, well, I tried it one day, and my boss is still a jerk, so that's not the point. In fact, we'll get into that a little bit in the book of Titus. A very interesting, interesting thing takes place within the churches of Crete as it relates to serving. And, um, but we'll get into that. So we see Paul identify himself as a servant. Notice, secondly, he identifies himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. So we talk about his relationship to God, a servant, his relationship to Jesus Christ, an apostle. An apostle. Uh, an apostle, the basic definition is a sent one. And um, um, what's interesting is in, in Romans 1, uh, Paul talks about how he's called an apostle. And what's interesting is the word there is not a verb, but it's a descriptive word, called an apostle. Like, like maybe you and I might be called a Christian. It's actually the same usage as they were first called Christians in Antioch. It was, it was something that he's known for, if you would. And, uh, and uh, as we talk about Paul's apostleship, the word apostle is kind of used in two ways in the New Testament. There was a generic way uh, uh, that, that it was used uh, when he talked about there were certain apostles, such as Saul and Barnabas. In, uh, in Acts 17, and they sent them, you know, the Holy Spirit said, sent, uh, separated unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work, or Saul and Barnabas for the work I've called them to, and so forth. And what did they become? They became sent ones, right? And so, in a sense, we could say our missionaries are all apostles. But we've kind of abandoned that word because then there is the proper use of the word apostle, and that is sent by Jesus Christ himself, the chosen apostle, if you would. And so, this is one who was called by Jesus Christ himself, and, um, and, uh, uh, there was an authority that was that, that, that accompanied it. These were God's specific apostles. And I think about how even the Apostle Paul was called the apostle to the Gentiles. That was a specific purpose. And uh, so to talk about the authority of the apostle, he was an apostle by qualification. He was a messenger. He received direct revelation from the Lord. And he said in many places, in the first Corinthians, um, both letters to the Thessalonians and Galatians. In fact, in Galatians 1.12, he says, Neither I received uh, it of man, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. Over and over again, he talks about how I received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you. Over and over again, he received these revelations from God himself. And so, um, but I like what he says in Galatians. He says, when I got this message, I didn't go and talk to the, apo- the other apostles. I didn't confer with them. But I got a direct revelation of Jesus Christ himself. Paul's an interesting character to study, by the way, when you start looking at what does that mean and what weight does that carry. It's really interesting. But as, the, uh, as an apostle, uh, apostle was one who is an eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, or of the resurrected Christ, rather. Uh, Acts 1, 21 and 22, uh, Peter stands up and he's there with, uh, with um, the, the early church there. And he says, Wherefore are these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went out among us, beginning with the baptism of John, unto the same day which he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness of us, uh, or with us, of his resurrection. So Peter lays it out. Here's what the apostle is going to be. He's going to be a witness of the resurrection. And um, so that's one of those qualifications. By the way, that's why I don't believe there are modern-day apostles. Uh, uh, one of the many, many reasons, we can kind of lay out several, several reasons in the scripture. But today, there are, you know, apostles, so-and-so. There's, we have several apostles in town, uh, believe it or not. 
we had there was an apostolic meeting at, at one church in town, and it was um, it was uh, both the pastor and his wife were apostles, and uh, given us their revelation, I guess. But um, but uh, I highly doubt they've seen the resurrected Savior, and I highly doubt their their relationship with the Lord started with John's baptism. That's a good time starter there because you might you might reason well i had an experience like paul on the road to damascus okay well how about this did you get baptized by by john the baptist but uh, anyways what's interesting about paul is he says this uh, about himself as a unique experience in first corinthians 15 5 to 9 and that he was seen of cephas and then of the 12 talking about the resurrection of christ after that he was seen of about 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. See, he was a, a later one, if you would, a later chosen or called. Um, for I am the least of the apostles, and I'm, that I'm not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So we see the authority of the apostle. Uh, he carried, carried authority with it, uh, and, and a part of that authority is divine inspiration. When Paul wrote, wrote it down and God preserved that thing, it was inspired of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God breathed. Our, now, by the way, today, if there are no more apostles, today, where did our authority and divine inspiration come from? It's been canonized in the 66 books. Yeah, that we call the Bible, the Word of God. As this would be formalized into a letter and sent out, uh, uh, sent out and preserved through the ages, Paul expresses his authorship in this book. Um, so we see the qualifications of the apostle. What was the mission of the apostle? Well, the mission clearly laid out in Scripture is this, to go establish churches. That was what they're called to do and to strengthen them and to encourage them and to establish them. Uh, uh, the apostle would establish his authority with the reader as he, as he lays it out, yes, servant of God, but an apostle of Jesus Christ, not only to Titus himself, but those that would read. Um, Acts uh, 1, 1 through 3, uh, the Bible says, The former uh, treaties have I made, O Theophilus, uh, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, unto the day which he was taken up, after that, uh, that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Uh, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. So God, uh, Christ, before he ascended, after he resurrected, he, he gives some instructions and he gives some things on to his apostles. And what do they do? They go on and establish churches. Paul, when he talked about meeting with the apostles there in Jerusalem, he talked about Peter in particular, and he said that he perceived them to be pillars, pillars in these churches. See, the mission of the apostle was to see churches grounded in truth. Ephesians 2.20, it says, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. By the way, I like that. Think about it. The apostles, the prophets, Jesus Christ himself. What does that represent? Here's what I believe that's referring to. That's the whole body of Scripture. Who wrote the Old Testament? The prophets. Who wrote the New Testament? The apostles. Who's it all about? Who's the central figure? The Jesus Christ himself. Hebrews starts off with God in a sundry times and diverse manners, spoke to us by the prophets in these last days, has revealed himself through his son, Jesus Christ. So, so the apostles, a very, very crucial part, integral part of the day that we live in, this church age day. See, we're here tonight preaching and existing, being established on the foundation of the apostles. See, it's not a church organization, it's not a denomination, it's not any of these things that we stand upon. We stand on the faith once delivered to the saints. It was carried on, it was passed on by the apostles themselves, once delivered on to the saints, and then it was passed on and established in that first century. And then that first century passed on to the second century, and the second century church passed on to the third century, and it went through the dark ages, and it went through the difficult times, and it went through all these ages, and yet it is still alive today, the faith once delivered unto the saints. You see, what we got to do, how do we establish error? How do we establish a cult? How do we establish a church that has drifted? They have departed from the faith once delivered. By the way, I got news for you, Joseph Smith. It was not twice delivered. I got news for you today, modern-day apostles. It's not twice delivered. It was once delivered to the saints. And what's our job? Our job is to pick it up and to set in order the things that are wanting. 
that is our call. That is our duty to stay faithful and true to this book. I know we may look weird, and I know we are going to be counterculture, and I know the culture is looking at us today and saying, oh, that view and that position is so archaic, and you can't take a literal approach to the scriptures and, uh, and going on and on about all these things. Don't you realize science has so surpassed it? After all, with science, we figured out that we have 84 plus or however many we want genders. I'd say we're more confused than ever before because we've part, departed from absolute truth. And what's happening? We have a lot of things that need strengthening and setting in order. Thank God I, for what we have tonight. See, the apostles' heartbeat was to establish churches. Their heartbeat was to evangelize the world. The 11 apostles, after Judas killed himself, Jesus appeared to them in Matthew 28. And he's there with the 11. And remember, it says some even doubted. And he says to these apostles, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always to the end of the world. And that 11 took that commission and said that's exactly what we're going to do. And as they went out with this gospel message, and as they went out evangelizing the world, they taught others to do the same thing. And then they taught others to do the same thing. And this thing kept going out, and it kept spreading. See, these apostles, not only were they faithful to their commission, but they were faithful to death. See, all the apostles lost their lives. They died a martyr's death except John, and that's because John was not done writing uh, uh, the Bible. God had one more book for him to write, so they boiled him in oil, and he survived. How would you like that? I don't know if I'd want to survive, honestly, but he survived. So they exiled him to the Isle of Patmos where he'd write the revelation of Jesus Christ. And every one of the other apostles died a martyr's death. Faithful to the end, the heartbeat of an apostle. Then notice what Paul says, and we'll finish with this. Verse number one. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. What's he saying here? He's saying to them, I'm a fellow believer like you guys. What's interesting there is, is, is sometimes the Calvinist likes to take this passage and say, oh, the faith of God's elect. This is the faith that was elected to him or given to him, instructed him. Do you know the word elect there is not a noun? The word elect there is a, an adjective. We did a study on election a while back, and, uh, and what you're going to find is election has to do with a person or persons or a purpose. And the person or persons it's always referring to is either the Jewish people or Jesus Christ himself. The purpose is service. And so the context is going to tell you which one of these does it fall into. And, and, and here, uh, elect, what are we, are we describing if it's an adjective? Well, the faith that God elected. God elected how you and I would be saved. It is by this way. By the way, how many ways are there to be saved? There's one way. That's God's choice. Uh, by the way, election is also an interchangeable word choice. So we're God's chosen people. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> um, uh, the Jewish people. But, but think about this now. God had chosen not multiple ways. Not, are you good enough? Not, not, well, you know, you did most of the things well, and so I think I'll give you a pass. No. He chose his own way of salvation. So, so here's what it says, that, that, that according to the faith of God's elect, the God's elected faith. Okay? And so what's he saying? He's saying, I'm a servant of God. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm a believer. I'm a believer like you guys. As, as, as Titus is going to go there and, and understand, think, think about how difficult this could be to, be to receive Titus with a commission from Paul to go and fix things. Listen, I've been in a church where I tried to get things lined up scripturally. I tried to fix some things. God even gave me this verse to say, here's what I want you to focus on. I want you to strengthen some things. And I'll tell you what, there's a ton of pride when you start doing it your own way. There's a ton of pride in programs and activities and things where it's like, look at we are doing a lot of stuff, but are you doing what God wants you to do? That becomes very difficult. So he, so he comes in with this letter and says, I want you to come with this understanding that the person who's sending you, servant of God, apostle of Jesus Christ, 
And guys, a fellow believer. We're brothers. We're brothers. I love, I love the verse when Paul, or when, when uh, go back to the Old Testament, when uh, Abraham and Lot, their servants, were fighting. And Abraham comes to, to Lot and he says, look, we be brethren. You know, we shouldn't be fighting. We'd be brethren. And I was like, that should be our attitude. We'd be brethren. Let's see if we can figure this thing out. And, um, uh, and so, so I think he's kind of connecting with them, understanding a part of his own testimony. Uh, and this salvation, it's according to faith, not of works. For by grace you are saved, uh, by faith, not of yourselves and the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. His faith was imputed in him for righteousness. Romans 5, 1, uh, uh, therefore being justified by faith, you and I, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What a tremendous truth, being justified by faith. Philippians 3, 9, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of, of Christ, the righteousness of God, which is by faith. See, a simple acknowledgement of faith that if anyone who reads this letter is saved, there's a connection immediately. I'm saved like you are. And we're, we're saved in this thing. We're serving the same God. We're following the same uh, mandates, if you would, the same direction, the same commission. I'm saved like you. Ephesians 1, 3, in whom also you have trusted, have you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. By the way, I love that passage. Um, I don't have time to get into it. I'm not going to chase the rabbit. But there's the order. You believe, you're saved, you're sealed. That's what happens. And by the way, it's simultaneous. When you call upon the name of the Lord, when you trust in Him by faith, you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And the acknowledging, and then it goes on, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. Acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. You know, sometimes we'll see, we'll see pa uh, weird, interesting passages. It talks about like believe, or, uh, obeying the gospel. Wait, I thought it's not of works. Obeying the gospel, what does that mean? It means you've, you've made an acknowledgement of the truth. You believe the gospel report and receive it unto yourself. By faith, believe the gospel. So he says it's the acknowledgement of the truth. Um, the faith is the full fruition of the, of the faith of God's choosing. It's, it's come to full fruition, if you would. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, uh, taken root. Why? Because you have acknowledged the faith uh, and you have acknowledged the truth which is after godliness. It's interesting what he says here, is, uh, or what, what he says to in 1 Timothy 3.15. Paul says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. This is the godliness that he has acknowledged. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on the world, and received up into glory. By the way, it's very interesting. He says, he didn't say Jesus there. He says God. Who was Jesus? He's God in the flesh. That's the mystery of godliness. See, he was a believer um, whose faith accomplished godliness. It was according to truth. Romans 10, 9 through 10. The Bible tells us, If thou shalt confess uh, with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart, God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And it goes on. Uh, you guys are familiar with the verse, but, but think about it. That's the acknowledgement of the truth. I've received the gospel. I've acknowledged it. I've made it my own. Um, you see, uh, <coughs> We look to the cross for salvation. And then we ought to assess our fruit and look to the Spirit as, as He works in us. Am I producing this? Because notice what it says there, which is after godliness. And this is going to be an important theme when we unpack the book of, uh, of Titus. Because just like in the book of Jude, the concern was ungodly men have crept in unawares, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Folks, that is taking place in church today. I don't know if you realize that. What does that mean? Well, the grace of God, for by grace you save through faith. It's a free gift of God. Um, uh, the grace of God, there's no works attached to grace, by the way. And it says turning it into lasciviousness. What's lasciviousness? It is, it is the, the, basically uh, the allowance, the inclination to live out our lustful activities. So I take the grace of God, and it's, it's a, this idea, well, I'm saved. I can go on and do this. Well, he's going to forgive me. I'll go on and do this. And, and what are we doing? We're dragging that grace through the mud, that precious gift. We, we are having these, in these uh, earthen vessels, these precious, uh, uh, what does the verse say? Uh, 
treasures. Yeah, there's treasures in earthen vessels. There's the phrase we're looking for. And we've taken that treasure of the gospel message, and what have we done? We've run it through the mud. And we've trampled all over the place. And he says, no, no, no. This same grace, this is in Titus also. The grace of God, which uh, uh, bringeth salvation, has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Because that is going to be an important part to what he's calling them to. Hey, don't be like the Cretans. They're liars. Somebody, in fact, is going to quote one of their uh, contemporary poets uh, in the book of Titus that, that labels what a, what a Cretan is. Don't be like that. God has called us to a higher calling. And if the gospel has not changed your life, is not working in your life, let me just say something's broken. Something's not working. And he says, uh, he says, we've acknowledged the truth, and to, to what end? That God is going to do work in us, that he's going to purify to himself a peculiar people, zealous unto good works. So when we talk about this, and, and I can, boy, I can't wait to dive into this book more. But we talk about this. I, I so see the same things going on there as is going on here. When you get on fire for God, when you become a peculiar people, and you become zealous, the wet blankets start showing up. The Christians that aren't doing anything for the Lord. The Christians that are under conviction in your presence. Not because you're preaching at them, but because you're doing what they know they should be doing. And so what do we start doing? We start making excuses. In order for me to feel better, I'm going to attack you because of your scandal. I'm going to attack you because of your godly conviction. I'm going to attack you because, you see what I'm saying? And we, we see it all around us, right? You know what a legalist is? Someone who has higher standards than you do. And we throw those words around. No, it's not really what a legalist is, but anyway. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I uh, quoted this a minute ago, but I'm going to say it again in Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. By the way, there's a great key there. It's the grace of God that you have. There's, I don't have time to start any topics. I'll just go with that. So here's the Apostle Paul saying, servant of Jesus Christ. And what a challenge for us, by the, or a servant of God challenge to us, right? Would you boil your life down to say, who are you? Well, I'm a servant of God. You know what we like to do when you first meet somebody, especially guys, we do this. When you first meet somebody, first thing, one of the first things you're going to tell them after you tell them your name, what do you do? Oh, I'm in this business or that business. Is that really who you are? That's like the least thing of who you are, right? Be able to run to that. Oh, what do you do? I serve. You serve. Do you need anything? called of God. You, know, you and I aren't apostles, but God has given us a calling. God's given us a purpose and a mission. And then folks, we be brethren. We're fellow believers with each other. What a wonderful truth that is. And I hope as we assemble together and we come together, we realize, you know what? God is calling us to a higher calling. Let's provoke one another to love and good works. Let's challenge each other to live godly lives. Let's, 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 let's so set ourselves apart, consecrate our hearts before the Lord that the Holy Spirit of God has room to work and start developing some things in our life. Rather than this, there is a truth in the Bible that you can resist the Holy Spirit, that you can quench the Holy Spirit. And quite frankly, I think that's where a lot of Christians are at. We don't realize it. And that's why we're not growing. First Samuel the Lord, the psalmist said, that would be our heart. I'm looking forward to this Sunday. I'll share with you as we pray in a moment. But let's uh, let's pray.